So now people will start coming into the room, Paul, and we'll give them about a minute and then we'll start. Hello everyone, thank you so much for joining us today for the next installment of the Pathologists Overseas uh, and ASCP um, Laboratory QMS course. Uh, today we're gonna hear from Paul Labbe, who is gonna talk about process improvement. Uh, before we get started, just a reminder, if you have questions, please put those in the Q&A box located at the bottom right of your screen. Um, this is questions for Paul, questions uh, about the topics in general, and we will get those answered. Um, on the bottom left of your screen, you'll see the chat function. Please use that only if you have technical problems or have issues uh, with connecting to the webinar. Please remember these are all being recorded and they are available on the landing page about 24 hours after the course is done so that you can watch them at your leisure, uh, including seeing all of the slides. Today, Paul will be using polling during the case uh, to ask you questions based on the case. So please be prepared to respond to that um, after the lecture. And we will do Q&A after the lecture and Q&A with the case. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Paul. Thank you, Dan, and welcome all. Uh, I would say good morning, but that's morning for me. I believe it's afternoon or evening for most of the attendees here. Um, my name is Paul Labby, and that MCLT behind my name is a Master's in Clinical Laboratory Technology, which I had uh, from the University of Dayton. I've got a 41-year um, laboratory management uh, career with CompuNet Clinical Labs, which was a large regional laboratory in Ohio in the U.S. here, but they were associated with Quest Diagnostics, so had the benefit of actually working a lot along the International Laboratory of Quest Diagnostics. I also was a uh, professor at the University of Cincinnati, an adjunct professor that taught laboratory management for quite a number of years. And since I retired from the uh, full-time career, I've worked with Heart to Heart International, um, CDC, CDC Africa, and have done quite a bit of consulting. So again, that's my background, and we're gonna talk about process improvement today. Now, we, we have a, uh, a goal, uh, obviously, or objectives here of, um, there we go, the learning objectives. At the end of this module, hopefully you'll be able to relate the historical perspective of uh, process improvement and then describe the importance of the PI in maintaining quality. Then explaining also the, the need for tools to monitor the laboratory processes. And hopefully all of that will uh, be uh, realized during this uh, PowerPoint presentation and within the case study. So the scenario we're gonna be talking about is an anatomic pathology situation where you're supporting a GI clinic by preparing patient tissue specimens collected by the on-site uh, gastrointestinal physician and the clinic staff. And then to be viewed and diagnosed by a consulting pathologist who uh, appears on a rotating schedule at this clinic. So, you know, the key question is, is how do you know that the process is working well and will it continue to work well into the future? Um, this is an actual case study that, that uh, just occurred in this past year of my consulting. And it was rather enlightening after all the years that I've spent um, what, what you find out when you do a little investigation. I think that the key part of overall process improvement, though, is always 
consider it a forward movement towards improvement. Um, there's going to be always these consistent updates, especially with technology. So we need to more or less ensure that we're adapting on an ongoing process to ensure our quality through these new technologies that, that we have. So let's talk about the, the QSE, the, the quality uh, system essentials. You've seen this slide before in, in previous presentations, but it's really key when you're looking at an overall process improvement program. There's so many facets that are involved, so many variables, which also then realizes many opportunities for that constantly improving. That circle of feedback is extremely key for ensuring that everybody that participates within the process is included and gives input as to those constant changes that are occurring. That's the only way you're going to achieve total quality management. So let's talk about the, the historical perspective. And again, I'm sure many of you have heard about uh, W. Edwards Deming's uh, 14 points on quality. He became famous when he uh, went to Japan post-World War II to help rebuild their industry. Um, quite frankly, pre-World War II, the products that were coming out of Japan were pretty well known nationwide as being cheap and cheaply made, wouldn't last long. And so what World War II presented to Japan was the opportunity to bring in someone with an engineering background that understood quality. Now he came up with these 14 points on quality, which you can see on the screen. Um, and they're all important, but in context of what we're talking today within the healthcare and the laboratory field, what we zero in on are those two uh, bolded ones there that create constancy of purpose for improving the, the products and the services and proving constantly and forever every process uh, for planning. So what we're doing is moving from the mentality of we've always done it that way, or if it isn't broken, don't fix it. Because if you're not changing with everything that's changing around you, then you're standing still essentially going to get run over and quality is gonna suffer from that perspective. So you have to think with all the other duties we have as scientists and all the processes and procedures that we have well-documented and written up, you know, in a sense, it's like, you're asking me to modify this again? Well, yes, we are because this new product came on board or the vendor supplied us with a new instrumentation and so we have to look at things a little bit differently from that standpoint while still doing what's best ultimately for the patient at the end of that, uh, that, that specimen that we've got. So Deming came up with a very simple cycle, a continuous cycle, again, that continuous improvement of PDCA, the plan, do, check, and act. You know, we always, always plan whenever we have a project to work on that we set down what the focus is and the guidelines, and we're going to identify the potential and the problems, the weaknesses and the errors. We're going to gather as much information as possible. We're going to best assess the current situation and perhaps identify root causes that would create any variances. The do part is after you've done all that planning, you're gonna start implementing those plans and putting them into action. But then you better check what that reaction is to that implementation. And again, there's constant learning. Sometimes you'll see this PDCA listed as PDSA, and the S there instead of check is for study. It's that constant learning that what is that impact? Did we consider all the variables? 
and do we need, need to make further modifications? And, and that's where the act or the adjust comes from. You have to constantly fill this circle with some good monitors and ultimately focus on what you were trying to gain with whatever plan you instituted to begin with, whether that was a brand new plan or whether it was a plan that says, okay, we've identified an error and we've got to fix it. We've identified the root causes, at least we think we have, and this is what we're going to do to move forward. Put that quote in there is active, act as if what you do makes a difference because it does. And this is a very individual but team process when it comes to whoever's performing that work. You can be the manager and plan very well, but if your staff is not fully educated on the process, fully bought into the process, then their actions may create variables that you couldn't foresee. Now let's reflect back to what this whole seminar series is about the ISO standards specifically for the laboratory, the 15189, and the upgrade that has occurred even since 2007 to the 2012. There's that uh, segment in ISO 15189, it's uh, section 4-12, describes very, a very developed series of activities for continuing improvement. The difference between 2000 and seven and 2012, they've gotten much more verbiage, much more detail in these five issues of developing the plan for the improvement, the implementation, the review of the effectiveness of the action, and then the adjustment. Again, that PDCA that helps you not just identify the potential sources of error, but then putting the process in place to correct them ultimately for good patient care, right? So we've got conventional improvement tools that we currently use in the laboratory and those are all good, they need to be done. We have good checks and balances within the various instruments that we use, whether that's that daily QC that is done or that weekly um, monitoring of certain specifics within the, the instrument. We have that external quality assessment. We have um, here in the US, obviously we have the uh, College of American Pathologists survey material there, but there's plenty of proficiency materials supplied externally for us as laboratorians to assess how we compare to uh, previous uh, or other laboratories, I should say. Then you have the uh, external audit and accreditation. Right now, I'm, I'm very much involved in our CLIA accreditations of some of the anatomic pathology laboratories here. It's been very interesting in this year of pandemic that those uh, audits aren't done on site, but they were done virtually. <laughs> and it was really a strenuous inspection to do it virtually because of all the documentation, the procedures, the certification processes, the uh, all this paper heavy documentation that you're sending back and forth uh, to the inspectors to achieve whatever accreditation uh, that is given for your particular laboratory. COVID presented us all with various challenges. I'm sure everyone agrees there. Management review is extremely important. You have to have an interactive and focused strategic minded management that ensures that they're getting the right people in the right positions, ensuring that you're having the proper support in everything that you're doing to make sure your laboratory is a success. And then obviously, again, going back to this process improvement, this continually looking forward, this continuous process of enhancing what you feel may already be a quality service or product that you're offering, but there's always, always room for improvement. And then going back again, making that full circle of, we talked about internal audits, there's those quality indicators throughout that you wanna make sure that you are measuring the correct things. 
And we'll talk about that a little bit later as, as far as, you know, if you're measuring something and it's there's no variance whatsoever, is it really needed at that point in time? Perhaps it is from a accreditation or regulatory standpoint, but is it really helping you assess quality if it's that consistent? So let's, <clears throat> excuse me, let's look at the overall quality plan. Again, we, uh, a lot of this is repetitive, but it's meant to be. Obviously, you know, you're going to hear the same thing over and over. You may even think, well, we do that. Well, let's take a closer look at that. Okay, yes, perhaps you do internal audits. Or yes, you're, you're having external proficiency testing. Quality assessments, that's where we could get into it a little bit more. Do we look at it from just a laboratory centric standpoint? Or are we looking at it externally and what is the clinical impact or the patient impact? For laboratories, sometimes this is a little tough to do unless you're right there with the patient on site, you're often looking at a patient specimen and uh, getting very little clinical information. But if you've got a good quality assessment program where you're working directly with clinicians, where they're, they're giving you feedback on certain results that you're generating, that's truly what is needed for a true quality plan. Quality control, I think we all understand what that means. But, but again, there's always those opportunities for, for improvement for that ultimate quality goal. So is your lab keeping up with technology? We talked about um, instrumentation briefly, but if you think about it, you know, if, if you ever had the opportunity to design your own laboratory space and maybe it took six months to a year to actually get that space built and laid out and, and all, all the things that you would plan for instrumentation and, and bench space and uh, reagents and supplies. And it looks great that first day. And then you start working in it and, and you realize, oh, what looked good on paper uh, didn't quite fit with how we're going back and forth getting types of things. And oh, seven months down the road, we've got a new instrument that we have to squeeze into this place. And so then we start making room for all of this process that we couldn't quite foresee or the space allocations that we need. And suddenly we're in a really cramped space. Suddenly we're walking in circles. I mean, think about, did anybody even think about putting charging stations for your iPads that you may have to take out into the field or uh, all the printers that, yeah, computers were supposed to reduce all that paperwork, right? But we still need printers because we need documentation that sometimes that electronic storage isn't quite available for us. There's always a chance for us to say lean down, which is optimizing that space, that time and activity and standing back and saying, whoa, we've got quite a conglomeration of stuff all put together here. Now you've probably all seen this spaghetti diagram as I best call it, it is a, a pre-lean program where uh, you can see the staff being uh, uh, through the, the various arrows here their walking patterns back and forth and how they're crisscrossing, uh, they're wasting time because to perform one uh, particular uh, process, they're walking four or five times around the different benches or the instruments. And then you, you map this all out by having the people that are doing this work look at this and say, okay, how can we streamline this better? Because if you can reduce the waste of the time, you're improving your efficiency, you're improving your more focus on quality, or from that perspective, even from a safety perspective, which is really key. I look at this sometimes 
being uh, at the age that I'm at and, you know, I can walk from one room to another with a purpose and get to that second room and it's like, okay, what did I come in here for? And uh, <laughs> so I end up walking back to the original room. Ah, the thought pops back into my eye, you know, and I think of these spaghetti diagrams all the time in, in a less humorous way, perhaps. So let's look at also then Six Sigma. You know, we're all familiar with uh, the, uh, the Gaussian uh, curve. And, you know, back in the 1800s, Carl Frederick Gauss came up with this uh, normal curve process of identifying what was an overall average of, of whatever event was occurring. Then in, 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 in 1920, Walter Sh Shepard came along with his uh, process thinking that says, okay, for a quality perspective, we wanna stay within you know, at least two, if not three standard deviations. But in the 1980s, Bill Smith was a Motorola engineer and he was um, in charge of addressing the quality of the products, um, the computer products that IT, uh, Motorola was, was putting out. And he created the Six Sigma program. It's like, let's go take this average curve out even three more standard deviations. And if you can get it down to a Six Sigma process, a formal structure of project planning to implement change, you're going to reduce your error rate tremendously. In Motorola's standpoint, it was their long range. Uh, they ended up saving $16 billion in savings, but they went from the, the, the strategic thought process of, okay, we're always going to have some systems that go out to the customer that aren't going to work, and we're going to make sure that we give them a, a replacement item and make that process as easy as possible. But then the, as they looked at how many um, units were going out that had an error to it in some fashion, they realized we got to spend a little bit more money upfront, making sure that what we're sending out to the customer is perfect the first time. And of course, then their customer service uh, improvement uh, skyrocketed and, uh, and obviously so did their business. So the structure of, uh, of Six Sigma is, is better known as, as DMAIC. And I uh, had the opportunity to go through the Six Sigma training program with Quest Diagnostics. Uh, it was a two year process. It was a 12 week um, educational process to become a black belt in Six Sigma. Uh, and then for the next two years, that was my role within the laboratory was to look at all these organized processes and determine where there could be um, better uh, results, um, more enhanced improvements. And it's a very structured, defined, measure, analyze, improve, and control. You're looking at the issues. You're trying to figure out exactly what it is that you need to measure. And then you're moving ahead with those uh, analysis, a lot of spreadsheets, uh, a lot of statistics to look at what causes all the variances in uh, lab processes and then um, moving on to um, improvement and control. But I will tell you that the toughest job with this is as you gain the input from everybody that's doing the job, and those are your uh, analog uh, tech technicians and technologists, those, those working with the instruments and equipment and analog, they each have obviously their own pattern. And while they are following a procedure, they also, they also have their own thought processes to how to improve it. So what you're doing through the Six Sigma, 
Six Sigma process is not just taking their feelings into account, but you're trying to show through the statistics that you're collecting that while their process that they're currently doing is fine and it meets the quality control aspects, what we're really trying to do is get down to that zero defects. And so the less variances that you may feel are important, but statistically are not, that's where we have to get everybody working together. That's the biggest challenge, in my opinion, with Six Sigma. So what is quality? It's defined as conformance to requirements, right? It certainly is straightforward, right? There's, there's no issues there. But, you know, I've got a, a I'm going to go off to a different story outside the laboratory on this one. Uh, when I was going through college uh, during the summer uh, to help pay for college, I worked at an air conditioning plant, and I won't name the uh, vendor, but it was a well-known international company. And there was 40 people on this assembly line for putting air conditioners together, and I was the number one person on that line, which meant that I brought the base pan of the air conditioning unit out onto the line. And behind me were there's two or three uh, uh, sets of uh, automated elevators that would bring me up in cages, a stack of 15 base pans that I would pull out of the cage one at a time and then I'd, I'd uh, kind of put sealant around and then pass it on to the next person. Well, the goal for this um, factory was to generate so many air conditioners in that eight hour period of time. That was the goal. There was no mention about quality, but you had signs about, you know, who had succeeded uh, that previous week and, and who was challenged to achieve even more. In this particular case, though, there was something going wrong with the production of the base pan down uh, uh, two levels below me, and I would start seeing some cracks in, in the corners of this base pan. And I'd have to set it aside and send it back down in another cage for a rework and a redo. But this one particular day, it, it got so awful that even though I had tried to catch the manager's attention and saying, we've got a problem here, um, he, he wasn't around, it wasn't timely. And I ended up shutting down the line because I didn't have a good base pan to send down to him. And, you know, everybody's astounded. It's like, you, you can't shut this line down. You're costing us money, yada, yada, yada. Well, the manager was pretty irate, comes charging at me and saying, what the heck are you doing? And I said, look, I, I've got two cases worth of base pants that I can't put on this line. And it's so clogged up that I can't get any more in the system. Well, that finally helped I mean, I, I did kind of a uh, Kaizen project at that point in time, but the, the message was finally gotten about, hey, you know, we got to get back into this quality check process. And, and believe me, uh, the week after, I didn't have any issues with any problems with base pans after that. But, you know, I shouldn't have had to shut down the line to do that. And, and I think sometimes we forget about that process of making sure we're getting feedback constantly from the staff members that are doing the work. Again, you've probably seen some of this, um, uh, these statistics, and this, this just blew my mind away when I saw this years and years ago. When, when you look at, you know, 99.9% .9 error-free sounds pretty good to me, right? But who wants to miss 32,000 heartbeats per person per year? I, you know, that just, that just doesn't sound right. So, you know, it, it, it goes without saying, we need to constantly improve. So the quality indicators definition, we need to establish the measures. Uh, ISO does this very good for us. Uh, we, we already do have good procedures and processes. The idea is to make sure that, again, we're constantly changing, we're constantly getting uh, that feedback. <clears throat> And making sure that our indicators are right on target. Uh, the drive to Six Sigma is zero defects. The only way you're going to get to zero defects is considering the performance, 
highlighting the concerns, determining what is quality for each step, identifying the areas needed for further study, and then the track changes over time. And by tracking changes over time, again, once you've made the change and you're tracking it and it, it seems to be set so that there's no variance, then it's time to look at a different indicator. Fewer is less, uh, er, I'm sorry, fewer is much better um, than having a ton, uh, too many indicators. Everybody kind of will just you know, do their checklist without really checking on them, so to speak. You wanna zero in on the fact that you need those factors for success on the things that you're monitoring. Again, thinking about the patient ultimately. Don't just think about um, the output of the laboratory. It has to be based on the stakeholders' needs. Start at the top and, and go down. It's so key. I've had many different bosses in my job. Some are very strategic driven, but sometimes their strategies don't quite include that quality assessment process. They think they're monitoring quality, but quite frankly, when they're not asking for that kind of feedback, then you know that strategically they're not driven by that. So we need to change, as I mentioned before, with our environment and our strategy, and then constantly look at our targets and goals that are based on statistics. Eight steps to developing successful indicators while well, being sure that you have an objective, understanding that methodology that's being used, understanding the limits. I mean, look at what we just went through with the pandemic and COVID and the seismic change that the laboratory went through and trying to come up with tests rapidly that would identify whether you know, someone had COVID or not. And, and there was a lot of work being done by a lot of scientists in the background trying to figure out what the limits were and what was okay to use versus what was just plain garbage. But getting back to the eight steps, interpretation and limitations, you know, again, there's gonna be those limits or those limitations, whether it's uh, the, the staffing that you're dealing with, whether it's the supplies that you have available to you, um, and then how you're going to present this um, indicator so that it makes sense to everyone that's viewing it. If it doesn't make sense, I've got a slide coming up here, that, you know, it, it it doesn't, it's not going to be a, a good indicator. You got, of course, your action plan and then the exit plan of, okay, you've got this all set up. It should continue to run smoothly, but you still have to determine at what point you need to check back in and make sure everything is still on target. This is no secret at all, although it's an amazing when, especially in my consulting role, I find out that um, the problem is easily solved by engaging with the folks who do the work because they know what the problems are. And you start talking to them in a very um, non-threatening fashion. In fact, this came up the other day in the presentation of we don't want to be in the blame um, method of doing things. We want to identify and correct the issues. So we want to applaud those staff members that bring us those problems that perhaps have already tried or have determined what the solution is. They really, really know what can be done correctly. The characteristics here of good quality indicators, um, measurable, achievable, 
you can read it and interpret it. <laughs> it's action oriented so that if it's showing a variance, you can clearly understand that and you can understand what is creating that variance. And that it's a balanced cycle of monitoring so that you're measuring it. Uh, there was a time where there was this one instrumentation in the laboratory that we did quality control on it just uh, once a day and instead of uh, once a shift because the vendor had originally said, yeah, you, you know, bring it up and you've got it running. And once you check out, then you're good to go for 24 hours. Well, that wasn't really the case. And so we balanced that cycle by saying, okay, we're gonna do this QC uh, more often. Again, engaging with everybody involved in the process and looking at both the short-term gains and the long-term satisfaction with what you have produced. So the bigger the organizations, perhaps the more they struggle uh, with spending thousands of hours collecting and interpreting data. Um, but uh, if you're looking at overall using the right metrics, as it states down there by the uh, Mark Brown's book, using the right metrics to drive world-class performance, then quit wasting your time by looking at, at stuff that doesn't ultimately mean anything for that score. I mean, if the score is, again, the number of units you produce, but what happens if 20% of those units you produce don't work very well? Well, great, you've achieved the score of producing those many units, but that's the wrong thing to monitor. You want to measure the number of units that work. You know, as simple as that sounds, it, it, sometimes, you know, we can't see the forest through the trees. So uh, again, I, I had a laugh at this slide from the standpoint of, um, I was involved in a, a, a process improvement program that involved just this, and it wasn't an individual PC, or it wasn't an individual calculation, um, you know, of a, a measurement that didn't mean anything. It was the idea that we live in the information technology world and we're talking a lot of different interfacing and a lot of crossing over of data and numbers and how that data is received into another system that perhaps is a competitor to the system that you're working on. Or we see this between the uh, iPhones and the Androids, right? I mean, there's that certain glitch that are going to occur between the the Macs and the and the PCs because they were just built differently. And we had this issue where the result that we were generating in our system was crossing over into a client system that was totally different. And all the data was there, but it was in such an awful format that it really couldn't be read. And we had to work with the IT engineers to determine what was that glitch in that data behind. So check those interfaces, the transmission of, of data across computers. You may have a quality result, but if it, if it can't be read at the other end, it doesn't work very well. Uh, some examples of uh, quality indicators. Uh, accuracy and appropriateness of tests is a real key. Um, you want to make sure that you have the right test at the right time, at the right cost, for the right uh, uh, clinicians to interpret it. Um, client satisfaction, obviously, is, is a huge one. You want to make sure that both your clinician and your patient are satisfied with that answer. You don't want to violate that trust simply because you don't have a good quality indicator in place. Um, blood culture contamination is, is, again, one that I was personally involved with because we had an issue at the one hospital that it was, it was too high. And again, it came down to educating of the collection staff 
that was doing the blood cultures. And we thought we had a pretty good process in place, but it came down to actually talking to some of those team members that either didn't understand the initial orientation or weren't following procedures. Either way, we've got an issue that we didn't have a good quality indicator. Well, actually we did in this case uh, of explaining why we had a, a percentage of contamination and we were able to reduce it by finally getting to the, the, the root causes. So, um, you know, quality is also um, reducing the variability. That's the key to excellence. I, I like this slide. I think it's a very visual impacting slide. You know, you can, you can be uh, unpredictable, you can be off target, or you can just get that re reduced variability and you've got everybody focused on that goal and, and you um, hit the target online. Again, team process, constant work with your, with your staff. So I mentioned this, you know, patient outcome indicators are the best quality, but they're most difficult to measure. Sometimes, the, you know, because of the patient variability itself and the clinical conditions, it's hard to, uh, for us as laboratorians to see that. Um, it requires large amounts of data. Um, again, let's reference back to worldwide pandemic, right? We've now got, we've had a lot of variables uh, and continue to have variables with the actual COVID itself. Uh, we've got a, a huge amount of data and we certainly uh, used an extended collection period of time. Um, you know, we, we all, I think, tried to plan from a laboratory perspective, we tried to plan for just this pandemic process. And some did better than others, quite frankly. Um, I, I think science took a leap forward um, with this pandemic, hopefully. Um, reiteration, continual improvement. You got to have that commitment that planning, that structure, that leadership, that participation, the engagement. It's, it's a lot of work, but once you get the team all focused again, and it, and it comes down to your, your leadership, right? Or, and, and, and you have the power to lead through example. You don't need a title to do that. People will watch what you do. And, and if you've built a good relationship, they're going to uh, follow your leadership in, in quality improvement. Again, uh, some of this is you know, repetitive. You know, you're always looking at root causes of error. Uh, the, what's the risk management as far as dollars and cents and the failures and potential failures and near misses the cost of inaction is always tough to uh, perhaps quantify. Um, oftentimes in, in my area, folks are looking at um, the cost of, uh, of adverse reaction and the, uh, the legal uh, impacts that that may create. Well, you know, that's, in my mind, that's not the way to look at it, it, it should be that we're trying to do the best for each and every patient. So it comes back down to what is that culture that you're driving to constantly improve? It's just such a key. And for those administrators that wanna push back and say it's gonna to cost too much money, it's like, well, let's talk about that. Let's detail that more and what is it what is the mission of this organization that we're working within? You may get them convinced, you may not, but you have to keep trying. Servant leadership, listening and collaboration. I've had great bosses that have done this very well, and I've had bad bosses that think they know what needs to be done and they just want you to do it. <clears throat> I didn't last very long with those kind of bosses, quite frankly. Uh, it was it was it was not good for my health. Uh, so you know you you move on when you 
when you uh, have to, because you've got your own goals to be as good as you can be, right? And you want to be within a team that fosters that improvement through openness, through commitment, and um, through just a gr great team process and constant feedback. It's really key. Management doesn't always know, but the workers do. We'll zero in on this constantly, and we're going to talk about this a little bit more in, in our case study coming up here. But continuous improvement does require that that leadership, whether it's from the top or with, from within, you, you need to constantly impress upon people. Um, hey, we're listening. This is what we can do. This is what we can't do right now, but we're striving towards. And this is just not within our wheelhouse at the pr appropriate time. You have to be honest and say, yeah, you know, we've got this wish list here, you know, and these are critical. These are central to our mission right now. And these are something we're going to invest in to get to where we need to be down the road. Um, apologies for not updating this slide, but you know, regardless of the timeline, it, it just shows that it's good for you to have a quality improvement activity that has one project every three to six months and you set a timeline and you monitor it and you look at it and you move on or you don't move on because you've discovered some additional issues and you want to um, deep dive onto those root causes and get those corrected and then you're going to start monitoring it again repetitive right quality improvement activities got to use the team approach I'm, i believe i'm speaking to the choir here uh, you all work within your teams, uh, you know, your scientists, you, you're in the medical and healthcare field. You want to, you want to improve people's lives. We talked about the audits, the reviews, the external quality audits, the, uh, off, uh, the OHFIs, the indicators and the, the six sigma and lean. So that that's kind of uh, the, uh, the, the summary and the historical perspective of, uh, of this uh, presentation. Um, talking about, you know, there's uh, easy uh, apples, the low hanging fruit, so to speak. There's some real poor practices out there that I'm sure you've already corrected in, in your various fields. You know, those are the, the, the ones that are quickly solved and, uh, and addressed quickly, but it's the other ones that take a little bit more um, experience, takes a little bit more um, identification to understand where the problem is. These, these are visually uh, obviously an issue. Information, but it's gotta be verifiable information. You know, certainly from the feedback, you're going to get suggestions and complaints. And there's a lot of good suggestions out there. It doesn't necessarily mean it's going to improve quality. It perhaps is one of those individuals as a customer that would like to see because that's their personal um, wish or comfort zone. So you want to zero in on and address all that feedback that you're getting and identify the errors from occurrence and then also um, the internal audits that you're doing. Constantly looking, constantly updating the monitors, um, constant, constant, constant. If possible, sure. Let's design a study that results can be statistically measured. I mean, absolutely. This is this is again what we were successful with with our blood culture reports. We we got a, a huge increase in, uh, in turnaround time uh, because we also then, you know, had reduced the uh, contamination uh, um, pre-analysis. Um, so anything that you can measure graphically is, is something that you want to post and want to brag about because that just solidifies with your team 
that there was a huge success in the project that you've undertaken or the monitor and the statistics that you've been collecting for the past three months. It's like, it doesn't go down a black hole. You wanna celebrate those activities. And then again, use it only as, as long as it, it provides you useful information, those indicators, continuous improvement. Don't get tied to your indicator. Don't be afraid to change there. Uh, Kaizen, a Japanese term, and it, it essentially means change is good. And this is where, um, and again, this was more from a manufacturing standpoint, where someone within the team would identify that there was a problem within whatever unit they were building or the service they were supplying. And so they would then do this crash um, six to eight hour program where they'd pull everybody together. They'd shut the, 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 the not the plant down, but they'd shut their, their segment of the plant down and they all get together and say, okay, we're seeing this issue occur. What can we do to address this? Get the individual commitment and that personal di discipline, that singular focus they had quality circles for that ongoing communication within this six to eight hours. And then they come up with this improvement plan and move forward. Um, Kaizen can be a day event. that can be a week long event. It just means that you're getting the whole team together on a focused goal of improving whatever it is product that you have, have been uh, producing for quite some time, but recognize that there's, it's, it's still not down to that zero defect or that, that 100% uh, uh, um, always working type of uh, process. So in summary, you know, uh, going back to Demi, each step is essential to keep the quality cycle um, cycling. And, uh, and, and then you got Zig Ziglar's uh, comment over there. People, people often say that motivation doesn't last. Well, neither does bathing. That's why we recommend it daily. So, you know, it's that motivation to constantly improve. You constantly want to make what you produce better for everybody. So hopefully you've gotten the key messages. And quite frankly, you know, as you have gone through this seminar process, um, a lot of this has been repetitive, but what you're doing is by attending these, you're, you're, you're educating yourself, you're motivating yourself, you're constantly improving. So I appreciate you participating in this. Quality counts. It enhances your return on investment. And if that investment is you, all the better, right? Continual improvement is the core of quality management. And if you're not, constantly changing, you're standing still and you'll get run over. So TQM, total quality management is delivering the right test or service to the right patient at the right time and at the right price, all because it was done with quality in mind. <clears throat> so at this point in time, um, we'll turn it over before we move into, I guess, the case studies. We'll turn it over if there was any uh, questions or comments in the chat. Looking at this, the, the, the quality service uh, uh, um, poster here, um, you know, I have to say that, you know, you see process improvement at the lower left there, but, and process improvement includes all of these circles, but my interpretation of process improvement and the key to it is that one at the top, the personnel. You get everybody focused on, on doing a process improvement, no matter what they're involved in, and you're gonna have success. Great, thank you so much, Paul. That was excellent. Um, there are actually no questions right now in the Q&A. Uh, however, for the participants, if you have questions throughout the case study, um, please feel free to use the Q&A box and we can um, ask Paul at the end of the session. So feel free to go on to the, the case study. Okay, thank you. So this is a situation that uh, uh, 
just encountered in the past eight months. Um, tissue artifacts can be introduced into a tissue specimen during any one of the many steps through which a specimen is carried before its microscope features are examined by the pathologist. And we're gonna review and discuss the process improvement techniques to determine how to address the case study presented on the random dry artifacts that were noted by the pathologist over a six month um, period of time. Um, this was where the, uh, the pathologist was named, uh, he was an experienced pathologist and he was named the medical director of this uh, laboratory, which was uh, based in the uh, gastroenterology clinic. And this pathologist would come once or twice a week to read the slides, depending on the number of procedures that were done at this clinic. So he had a, a staff of uh, two histo technologists that would prepare the specimens within the laboratory. They had a tissue processor that had uh, quit. It was an old tissue processor and it had uh, quit about uh, about the time that he started as a medical director. Um, and they got a new uh, tissue processor in. And uh, it was actually uh, the previous uh, medical director that had taken the history text through the, the checklist of the validation of the instrument and uh, tested all different types of tissues and, and basically then checked off the, the tissue processor. Um, the other back background was that uh, the only other uh, variable is that uh, the gastroenterology clinic had two um, GI docs that would collect these uh, various tissue specimens in, in their uh, in their procedural rooms, um, and they had a they, they each had a staff of, of four different staff members that would rotate <clears throat> uh, assisting the pathologist with collecting and placing the specimens into the uh, specimen containers to, to be sent to the, uh, the laboratory. So Dr. Ray uh, mentioned about how over the past six months, he's been noticing dry artifacts on random slides. So we asked the histotech about it, and uh, they said the same thing, that they had kind of noticed the same thing. So um, at, th at this point, I think what I'll do is, is have you uh, uh, post the, uh, the, the various questions that we put up there. So what variable is important to identify the cause of the dry artifacts? Staff collecting the tissue, laboratory processing the specimen, the tissue processor impact, the improper slide production, all of the above or none of the above. And I can't vote. So it's up to you guys. And Emily, how much time do you give them? I believe they get about a minute to, to go. Okay, all right. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll let you know once about 80 or 90% have uh, had a chance to vote. Okay, great, thanks. I didn't know if I had to fill in the dead space or not. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to go ahead and end the poll and share the results. Okay. Fair amount. 
So with what little information you have at this point in time, I, you know, that there's not really too much of a surprise there. Some of you are trying to uh, project what you think the issue might be, and that's fine. Uh, all of you, uh, it looks like 70% uh, of you are saying, well, I'm gonna hedge my bets and take a look at all of them, right? Fair enough, all right. So keep that in mind. Let's move on to the second uh, question. And thanks for your responses to the first one. And to help you out in case you weren't paying attention, the PDCA, Plan Do Check Act, and the DMAIC is that Six Sigma define, measure, analyze, improve, and control. answer is hmm, pretty even split here. So we can, you know, uh, th this is the uh, unfortunate thing about not having, you know, a true interaction here, because I'd, I'd love to hear some of, uh, of your thoughts as to why you chose a particular one. Is there any right answer here? Well, you know, the PDCA and the DMAIC are a little bit more intensive uh, from the standpoint of drilling down, trying to find the root cause, but you could interpret review of all procedures as trying to drill down a review. It's interesting though that there's a very small percentage um, that wanted to get feedback involved from the staff uh, that are doing the collection. So again, there may be the assumption that that would be done with the three above that. And I'm assuming that's that's how you, you chose that. So again, thank you for that response. Uh, I think we might have one more polling question. Yes, coming right up. Okay, thanks. Actually, it looks like there's four in here. Oh, is there four? Okay. So utilizing the process recommended above, identify the potential cause of this random dry artifact occurrence. Is it equipment failure? Is it individual staff not following the procedure? Is it a power failure? Is it an imbalanced, imbalance of reagents? And realize again, the potential is in the, the uh, statement there, utilizing the process recommended above, you identify the potential cause of this random drive artifact occurrence. Votes are coming in a little more slowly on this one. <laughs> no problem. 
We're almost to 60%. Well, you know, if I was uh, on the other end of this, it's like, yeah, well, which one would I choose? You know, I, I, I don't have enough information. Okay, we're at two thirds. So I'll go ahead and uh, end this one and share the results. Wow. All right, so is this, okay, blame the staff, right? <laughs> They're, 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 they don't do as good a job as the laboratory staff, right? It's those, it's those staff members that work with the physicians. Okay. <laughs> Just kidding here, though. You really had little to work on here. And, and uh, you know, each one is certainly a possibility. And I'm going to try and interpret. Okay, so because you're laboratorians, as, as I believe most of you are, or at least in the medical field, you're going to think, well, if it was equipment failure, that would be, you know, pretty identifiable. And Paul had mentioned that, you know, it had passed validation, yada, 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 right? And obviously a power failure, you know, wouldn't have been random because everybody would have noticed those occurrences at that time. An imbalance of reagents, certainly, you know, you could, uh, you know, mix something up in, in that slide uh, that uh, could create that. But I think the core of folks have recognized that it really is um, probably more of the collection process that was taking place. So is this, was this the fourth one or is there one more to go? There's one more. Okay. All right, present the improved monitoring to ensure this issue is not repeated. Well, again, you know, it's gonna be guesswork, right? Because you don't even know what created it at this point in time, I haven't told you that. But um, present the uh, improved monitoring. You're gonna do da daily check-ins with the staff. You're gonna improve staff orientation with specific checklists. You're gonna buy new equipment or you're gonna fire oh. staff and hire new staff. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe maybe this is where I should uh, explain what we found, huh? <laughs> um, but essentially, um, yes, it was it was a staff issue. So knowing that, then you can you know answer it and say, yeah, okay, improve staff orientation with specific checklists. All right, good job. Well, thank you. Now, here's here's what the case was. So yeah, we we dug down within the laboratory and the processes that they were doing as far as uh, you know the variables seem to be the new tissue processor perhaps, but all the monitors appeared well there. And what was noteworthy is when the histotech did say, yes, I've noticed that also to the pathologist. So right there, it was like, well, we need to have a little bit better ongoing communication between the pathologist and the histotech. You know, just because they're just rotating through here doesn't mean that they can't communicate, whether it's, if it's not in person, they can certainly can communicate by email or text messaging or what have you. So that was one of the key uh, things that we needed to address right there. The second was, okay, let's then go back and look at the procedures for the, the collection of the specimens. And according to the written procedure, you know, it looked great. It clearly stated, especially for the staff, the GI docs and the staff, it said, you know, once the specimen is retrieved from the patient by the physician. The um, physician or staff member places the specimen directly into the specimen container. And then um, clearly identifying, you know, what it is and, and all the other um, identification measurements that have to be on both that, um, specimen container and the, the requisition. 
So in the initial conversations, when we said, look, we're having this issue because the pathologist did talk with the, the GI docs and the GI docs reiterated the process with their staff members. But it was the key factor that was said by the pathologist when he was talking to the staff members as they were going through the procedure, because they're, they're all saying, yes, that's exactly what we do. It's what we do. Except when the pathologist says, you know, what it almost looks like is it is perhaps somebody is taking that tissue and putting it on a piece of gauze before they put it in the container. And right away, right away the, the, uh, the one staff member, he says, well, yeah, uh, sometimes I don't have that lid off just yet and I'm putting it on a sterile surface. So, you know, I, I do that to unscrew the lid of the specimen container and then I put it in. And, you know, his, educational process was, well, you know, I'm, I'm still treating it sterile, right? Well, yes, and it doesn't say anything in the procedure about not putting it on gauze, but it did say put directly into the specimen container from the forceps or whatever is holding the, the you know, specimen. So, so you know, a re-education, uh, uh, the specific checklist type of thing that we've instituted with the orientation of new staff members and existing staff members. It says, here's why this is so important that it goes directly into that laboratory container with a solution that it doesn't create any additional artifacts that would appear on that tissue. And so that was, that was the resolution there. Now, did we use the PDA, PDCA or the DMAIC or what have you? Well, actually what we did is we just, all of it, but we kind of went more directly to the people that are doing the test or in this case, the collection and, and gaining their feedback. So it was that communication piece that was real key. Now, it was amazing. Obviously, the pathologist hasn't seen any dry artifacts since then. And so we know that, you know, we identified and luckily it was presented in such a case that there wasn't going to be a blame or that staff member wasn't going to be fired. It was all focused on the ultimate best result for the patient and that this practice, this uh, clinic was very, very focused on patient satisfaction and patient quality. So everybody looked at it as a great example of constant review, constant improvement, and we can always be educated. So again, thank you. Um, is there any other additional comments or questions at this time? Thanks so much, Paul. That was really helpful. Uh, we did have one question from George. Um, so he's asking for quality indicators, things like customer satisfaction. Is there a point when the lab stops monitoring these quality indicators? No, not when it comes to customer service, because, well, again, depending on what your, you know, what your product or service is, your, your customers may vary on a constant basis. So that in itself um, gives you the opportunity to get constant feedback from many different sources and it's not always going to be from the same individual or customer, right? It's, it's going to be from, um, and that's not bad. I mean, if the same customer keeps complaining about something in particular, then it, it's something that you're going to either have to fix with that customer or say, you know, we I understand what you're saying, but we can't fix it. So my response as far as customer service goes is making sure that if indeed your customer service base is constant and you're always getting feedback from the same people, then ask the service question or monitor the service issue in a slightly different way. I hope that makes sense. And please follow up if it doesn't. But yeah, you always, always, always want 
feedback from all, uh, your, your ultimate customers. Great. Thank you so much, Paul. Um, we also have a, more of a comment from uh, one of the uh, participants. So for random dry artifacts over six months, while well, you should uh, access the staff, one may also consider an equipment failure since uh, many staff may be involved in specimen collection. So, you know, they may not all just be making mistakes. That was, I don't know if you have any comments about that, considering um, an equipment failure over, um, you know, a staffing issue. Well, absolutely. That, that's very true. Yes. Um, however, we did, we could not see anything that would, in this particular case, we did look at the equipment again, and we look not just at the previous validation studies, but we, what we did look at is because it was random and we were able to identify the randomness uh, per date and time, and they were on different dates and times that the equipment produced other tissues at that same date and time arena that weren't showing the dry artifact. Now, yeah, I suppose it still could have been a random issue within the equipment, but it didn't appear to be the case in, that, in this particular instance. Hope that helps. Great, thank you. Um, I believe that's all the questions in the Q&A function. So unless um, we get any last minute ones in the next few seconds or so, uh, I think you've answered everybody's questions, Paul. Thank you so much. Uh, oh, it's been, been my pleasure. Thank you. Uh, and thanks to all the um, participants for participating with the questions and the, um, the polling function. My quote there from Lily Tomlin, the road <laughs> to success is always under construction. Isn't that the truth? <laughs> Yeah, great. great. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. Webinar. So we look forward to seeing the attendees on the next one on uh, next Tuesday. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.